Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. First John chapter 3, verses 1. First John chapter 3, verses 1. If you have the Amplified Version with you, you will read with me. The Bible says, See what an incredible quality of love the Father has given, shown, bestowed on us. See what quality of love the Father has given us. See what quality, what quality, what quality. But he's saying, see, see it, see it, see it, see it. The writer of this is not simply trying to express something that ends by his own experience as a writer. No, he's trying to extend that to provoke us to search out the perception, the revelation of this quality of love. He's saying, see, see what incredible quality of love the Father has given and bestowed on us. He says that we should be permitted to be named and called and counted the children of God. And the Bible says, and so we are. He says, we are the children of God. The reason that the world does not know or recognize or acknowledge us is that it does not know or recognize and acknowledge God. That's why the world doesn't recognize it, because they don't recognize and know God. See what quality of love that the Father has given us. This love is a revelation. It's not just a thought. It's not just an assumption. No, it's a revelation. It's a revelation. You have to see it with your spirit. You have to perceive it in your inner man by faith. You have to see it. You have to see it. And if you read that verse in the message version, that very portion of scripture in the message version, it says, what marvelous love the Father has extended to us. Just look at it. He's saying, look at it. Look at it. The question is, do you see it? Can you look at it? Can you look at it? And tonight as I'm speaking, there's something I want you to see. Because when you see it, you will stop to fear anything. You will not fear anything anything. So the Bible says, what marvelous love the Father has extended to us. He says, look at it. He says, we are called children of God. That's who we really are. But the Bible says, but that's also why the world doesn't recognize us or take us seriously, because it has no idea who he is and what he's up to. I love the way the message version says it. The world does not take us serious because it doesn't know who he is and what he's up to. Oh, the world doesn't take us serious because he doesn't know who God is. He doesn't know what his love means. He doesn't know what he is up to. The world doesn't know what God is up to when he says that we are his children, his offspring. It has no clue. Why? Because the world says the world doesn't know him. The world doesn't know him. In other words, the world doesn't know who calls us his children. The world doesn't know who calls us his offspring. It doesn't know who God is. I wish they know that the God who is calling us his children parted the seas. I wish they know that the God who calls us his children levels valleys and mountains. I wish they know that the God who calls us his children created the world by a word. 
by a simple word, let there be light, and it was. Day and night. But that is the God who created seasons. But that is the God who created days. But that is the God who created hours and minutes and seconds. But the God who calls us his children created the seasons and times. Glory to God. Glory to God. That he owns this world. That the universe is in his hands. The Bible says that he created the earth without pillars. That that is our father. Glory to God. That is the owner of all the silver and gold. That is our father. That he owns the air we breathe. That is our father. The world doesn't know. That's what the message version says. The world doesn't take us seriously. Because it does not know him or know what he's up to. In other words, it is a big deal to be a child of God. It is a big deal to be a child of God. To be called a child of God. To be called a child of God in this hour, in this time, when people are dying, to be called a child of God. Do you know what it means to be called a child of God? The world might not know, but at least you as a believer must know. What it says we are members of his body, of his flesh, of his blood and his bones. We are children of the Most High. And the world doesn't know that. But that's okay for them not to know that. It's all right. But you as a believer must know what quality of love that is. What quality of agape, the love of God, what that quality is that you are called a child of of God. The world might not know. And it might not take us serious. <laughs> because it doesn't take God serious. He doesn't consider God serious. He doesn't know what God is able to do. The world trusts its own inventions and creations. Its own intelligence and philosophies. Its own ideas and wisdoms. Because they don't know who God is and what he's able to do. But we, his children, know or ought to know what it means to be called a child of God. I want you to say, Father, I thank you. Because you have loved me enough to call me your child. To call me your child. To call me your child. What a glory. What a glory. What a glory. And as we delve deeper into this love, I want to help you understand the consequence of that love. The consequence of that love. Sadly, some believers out there also do not know what it means to be loved by God to be called his children, his offspring, his seed. I've had all kinds of ideas of why uh, there's disease happening in the world or why this is happening or why that is happening. Oh God is punishing. Oh God is judging. Oh God is doing this. Oh God is doing that. Oh God is doing this. What about his children? Haven't Christians died also in this period? Some have. Even believers have died. So you want to say God is judging them? No. We need to understand God according to his word. We should not be like the world that does not know God. We shouldn't be like the world that died know God. We don't blame them for them not knowing God, but we know God because we are his children. We're his children. You need to know the power of that love. You need to know the consequence of that love. You need to know the vindication of agape, the justification that follows that love. I'll read you something so powerful. 
in John chapter 17, the Gospel of John chapter 17 from the 22nd verse, the Amplified Version of that. I want you to see the consequence of God's love. This is Jesus in his own words. He says, I have given to them the glory and honor which you, Father God, have given me. This is Jesus speaking. That I've given the children, the believers, the church, my glory and honor which you have given me. The very glory and honor with which God bestowed on the person of Jesus. Now Jesus here in that expression says that he has given to the church, to the believers, to the children of God. He says that they might be one even as we are one. I in them, that is Jesus in us, you in me, that is God in Jesus, in order that they might become one, the Bible says, and perfectly united, that the world may know, listen, that the world may know and definitely recognize that you sent me and that you have loved them even as you have loved me and that you have loved them the believers the children of god even as you have loved me your son this is jesus what a powerful thought so he means the consequence of that love was the bestowing of glory and honor to the church we carry the glory of Christ. We carry the honor of Christ as a consequence of agape, as a consequence of that love. Let it sink. Let it sink. Allow it to sink in your spirit. It has. God does not just love you. And then says, ah, you know, because I love you, I love you, just stay there and let destruction befall you. Oh, I love you. No, 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 no. Notwithstanding that we've seen many calamity and disaster before Christians. But God is showing us something here. He is showing us something here. And I don't know how the rest of the world sees this, but when I read that the consequence of agape was the bestowment of the very glory and honor that sat on the person of Jesus Christ. Now is on the church in this very hour. Oh. Think about it. The very glory. Take it in. Allow it to enter your brain and saturate your spirit. Allow it to consume your soul and meditate keenly on the thought that the consequence of God's love to us in being called his children has given us all the glory and honor that was bestowed on the Christ. <laughs> now, I hear many believers who say, you cannot share in the glory of God. Oh, because they are caught in an Old Testament covenant. But the truth is right here. It is gleaming on our faces before us, looking straight in our eyes, telling us that this was Jesus saying that the glory and honor which you have given me. Has God given any glory on the person of Jesus? Yes. Has God given honor to the person of Jesus? Yes. And Jesus is saying, the glory and honor which you, Father God, have given me, Jesus. He says, I have given them, the church, the believers, the children of God, now, let's imagine the glory in which the person of Jesus Christ is for a second. Just imagine the honor and glory in which the person of Jesus Christ is. And he says that also is given to the church. What is sickness when it comes into that glory? 
What is bondage when it comes into that glory? What is poverty when it faces that glory? What is weakness when it faces that glory? What is death? Paul says, death, where is thine sting? What is death in the face of the glory that is on the person of Jesus Christ? The world might not know that the man you believed walked on a tomb four days in the death of a man called Lazarus. And once the stone was laid away, he called that man out from the dead and that man had life. The world might not know this. But as a believer, you ought to know this. Or at least to believe this. That it is true. <laughs> glory to God. That it is true. That the glory on that man could not let him be consumed and destroyed when he ascended in hell. But on the contrary, the Bible says he went in hell and shook them a not, made a public spectacle of them all triumphing over all of them. The world does not know, but we know that that's the man that walked on Jairus' daughter and raised her. That's the man that finds blind men at the pool of Bethesda. Lepers are healed by that man. Men with infirmities are healed by that man. That is the Jesus whose glory and honor blind but mass. That is the glory on that man that opens the eyes of blind Bartimaeus. A man 38 years at the pool of Bethesda, hit with an infirmity. Jesus, with that glory and honor, is the one that delivers such a one. The woman with the bleeding issue, it is the glory and honor on the person of Jesus Christ that does all those things. And then he tells the church, which is still alive in 2020, I mean, it's all of this crisis that is happening. And he says, the glory and honor that you have given me, he says, I have given them. Wow. Wow. He goes to a girl who is dead. Talitha Kumai. Little girl. Rise up. And she has to get up. And when he dies and is raised from death, he gives power to us. And even when he's long gone, in the name of that man who has given us glory, who has shared his glory and honor with the church, a man is found at the temple called Beautiful, crippled. And one believer in that man with the same glory tells this man, silver and gold have I not, but that which I have I given to you. Rise up in the name of Jesus Christ and walk. And that man rises up in the very hour. That glory and honor bestowed on the church. Bestowed on the church. And even after the going of that man, various miracles, signs and wonders were demonstrated by the apostles, the early church, all through history to present hour. That glory and honor that was on the person of Jesus Christ has not left the church because disease has come in the world. No. Because poverty is in the world. No. Because bondage is in the world. No. Because turmoil is in the world. No. Because destruction is in the world. No. Because there are plagues left, right and center. No. That glory still abides to the church and it is a consequence of that agape. I wish some people understand what it means to be loved by God. Let me read for you a scripture. It's powerful. I love it. It's short scripture but it's so beautiful. So beautiful. So beautiful. And we're going to read it in the Amplified. In Colossians chapter 3 verses 14 the Amplified Version, Colossians chapter 3, verses 14. He says, And the Bible, put on love and enfold yourselves with a bond of perfectness, which binds everything together 
completely in ideal harmony. Let me read it again. He says, and above all this, put on love and enfold yourselves with a bond of perfectness which binds everything together completely in ideal harmony. Now, let me first open your eyes to something here. It's already beautiful. As it is, it's already beautiful. But let me even share more so you see the beauty of this scripture. When you read the original Greek translation into the English, you will realize in the Greek translation, there is no word put on. That is why in your amplified version, it's put in a box, right? In quotes, in brackets. When you read the original Greek language, from where we translate this to English, there is no such a word as put on. In fact, when I read it from the original Greek, this is what it read like. In the original Greek it goes, and above all these is agape. And then you see there's no word there, the enfolding word there. No, in fact, in the Greek it reads, and above all these is agape, which is the bond of perfectness. Which is the bond of perfectness? Which is the bond of perfectness? In other words, when you embrace agape, the love which is of God, you cover yourself, you enfold yourself with the bond of perfectness. And this bond of perfectness binds everything together completely in ideal harmony. Wow! What a thought! What a thought! So if I was to read this in the Greek translation, it would sound like, and above all these is agape, which is the bond of perfectness. And when we are talking about perfectness or perfection, we're talking about everything bound together completely in ideal harmony. In other words, when we embrace agape, all things start coming together to agree with each other. Has agape left the world because we have a plague? <laughs> no. No. He says, what can separate us from the love of God? Is it death? Is it turmoil? Is it things present? Is it things to come? Is it angels? No. He says nothing can ever separate us from the love of God which is revealed in Christ Jesus. Paul calls that a persuasion. He is persuaded that nothing, not death, not things to come, no light, no angels, no principalities, no powers, COVID is a power. He says, no things present, no things to come. He says, none of those things shall separate us from the love of God, the love of Jesus Christ, which to me, in my revelation, in understanding, is forever fixed, it abideth forever. Agape never leaves. Agape is with us for the rest of our lives. God is love. And he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. The Bible says, when you go through waters, deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through fires, he says, I will be with you. That means God is with us most in our most trying moments. Your ever-present help in time of need. He is with us most in our most trying moment. When people go through waters, he says, it, when you are in those waters, I am with you. When you are in those fires, he says, I am with you. He says, I'll not even let you smell the soot of fire. Church, God is with us. This is the message we're supposed to be telling the world. That God is with us. Emmanuel. God with us because he loves us he's not going to leave us now no more than ever before I tell people he says he is with us most when we're in the most trying moments God is present 
in the earth in this hour than he has ever been present before. I believe it. But our eyes fixed on responding to that presence and love, or our eyes are fixed on the destructions, the pestilences and the plagues that concern this hour. Where are your eyes? This season for me, I sit and I hear God speak more than he has ever spoken to me before. The dreams and visions that I have in this season, some I even wake up and just weep. God is speaking louder than I've ever heard him. And I believe he's not only speaking to me. He's speaking to everybody out there, every believer. There's a voice and the word of God opening to our spirits in this hour more than ever before. We're not forsaken. We are loved. We are the beloved of God. I sit down sometimes to write a sermon. And four or five sermons come. They just come in my spirit. And I find that I write all of them. I have hundreds of sermons I've not preached. Waiting to be preached. And all of them are as an expression of that glory and honor that has been bestowed on us through the person of Jesus Christ. God loves us. I said God loves us. And he says that if we, above all things, connect to agape, the love which is of God, he says this connection enfolds us in the bond of perfectness, ideal harmony, all things completing and connecting with each other in that particular order. That means if we continue connecting to agape as the church of Jesus Christ, the love of God, everything that is out of order in the world is going to start getting into ideal harmony. For he says all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. Be not mistaken. But while many things are falling out of line, God is shaping and putting many things together to the glory of his name. And that's the consequence of the agape. That's the consequence of the love that he has towards us. Praise God. Glory to God. And because of that, in Jude chapter 1 verses 20, if you will read with me in the Amplified Version, he says, But you, beloved, you, we don't know what the world is going to do. But we have a message for you. He says, but you, beloved, he's saying, build yourselves up, founded on your most holy faith. He says, make progress, rise like an edifice or a construction, higher and higher, praying in the Holy Spirit. He's telling us, in this hour, more than ever before, we are supposed to be praying. And as we pray in our most holy faith, that I believe in speaking in tongues, as you open your mouth, I find myself, my heart, my spirit, every hour finds itself praying. And sometimes my mouth moves in tongues. I feel it. Okay? Now, I see that it's saying that we have to build ourselves up. You build yourself up when you speak in tongues. He says, founded on your most holy faith. He says, make progress. Rise like an edifice, higher and higher. Rise like a building. In other words, he's saying, when you enter the place of prayer and then start speaking in your most holy faith, speaking in tongues, praying in the Holy Ghost, he says, you are like a man building. And as you're building, you're adding levels to this building. And you're rising higher and higher as a building, as a construction, as an edifice. You're rising from the ground, from nothing to something. Every time you pray, something is rising on you. Something is rising in you. Something is rising about you in the spirit realm. And that's the beauty of prayer. That's the beauty of prayer. As I said, I don't understand how a Christian cannot have a praying life when you know that every time you pray, you're building yourself as a building, as an edifice, higher and higher. Praying in the most holy faith. 
which is speaking in tongues, praying in the Holy Ghost. He says, you're building yourself, you're building yourself, you're building yourself. If you understand that, nobody should tell you to pray unless you're comfortable with where you are. But if you're not comfortable with where you are, or if you believe that even though where you are is a place, but there's a place higher than you, then God is saying, here's the antidote. Rise. Rise as that edifice. But through praying in your most holy faith, which is speaking in tongues, praying in the Holy Spirit. Why do I call speaking in tongues the most holy faith? Because it's the one guarantee, the most perfect guarantee of praying according to the will of God. He says the Spirit of God intercedes according to the will and purposes of God. It's the person of the Holy Spirit. He prays through us. Because we, sometimes we don't know what to pray or how we ought to pray. But he comes and helps us in our infirmities. And he speaks in groanings. Okay? And the Bible says, he prays according to the will and purposes of God. So, if the Holy Spirit gives you utterance in the speaking of tongues, that means you are praying in the most perfect harmony of God's will and purpose concerning your life. And so, he says, pray. So he's saying, but in this prayer, verses 21, again, he says, God and keep yourselves in the love of God. In, in all this praying, don't lose that love. God and keep yourselves in the agape of God. What is agape? The love which is of God. The very love which is of God by his nature and person. That's agape. Not the other kinds of love, phileo or, or eros or stoke. No. This is agape. The Greek there used is agape. He says, God and keep yourselves in agape, in the love of God. He's saying, don't pray with a prayer in your heart as one who thinks, oh, I'm praying because I'm judged. I'm not loved. I'm being punished. I'm being consumed by God because of his anger and wrath. That's the wrong attitude. So some people, even though when they're speaking in tongues, they pray in the will and purpose of God, many of them, their heart is contradictory because it has a different understanding and expectation of that God. And because of that, the Bible calls that being double-minded. The Bible says that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So the Bible says that man should not expect to receive anything from God because he is double-minded. That is why he sends pastors, preachers, evangelists, prophets, apostles, that he might perfect you, the saints, for the work of ministry, to the edification, edifice, edification of the body, till we all reach that full measure, that full stature, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we may not be babes, which are tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine and by the slate of cunning and evil men which lie in wait to deceive. God knows the danger of praying with two minds, two understandings, mixed messages and voices. And that usually happens when the heart of a man is not praying in line with that man's confession. You might pray in line with the will of God in your speaking in tongues. But yet your heart is contrary to the understanding of God's mind touching that hour. I tell people, how can you even claim to be interceding, those of you Christians who are interceding for the world, when you don't know the mind of God? How can you be interceding? How can you intercede on behalf of another to one whose mind you don't understand. The mind of God is important to know in this hour more than anything. What is God saying? You see, he gave us the word. He gave us the word. He gave us the word. 
But some people, because of fear, because of worry, because of emotional instability, some are vying off the word. Let God be true and every man a liar. The word of God is true in this hour as it was years ago. And will be true tomorrow. He said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall abide forever. The Bible says he has even exalted his word above his name. Yes, he's Jehovah Jireh, your provider, but his word is above that. It's above that. It's above that. It's above his name. In other words, he esteems it. Even if you don't relate with the name as much, he esteems his word above his name. He esteems the fact that he has spoken. And there is no word he has spoken that shall not come to pass. That is the confidence that we have in him. That is the only thing that causes us to face the world even in the worst circumstances and still believe for healing of any disease, for deliverance of any disease, because his word is his bond, his word is his person, and the Bible says, of which it is impossible for God to lie. So he sent us in the world with that glory and honor, and he told us, go ye in the world, heal the sick, he said, heal the sick. It doesn't matter if the world doubts that the church of Jesus Christ has a responsibility to heal in his name. That's their problem. Not the problem of the believer. We believe that word. So he says, go ye in the nations, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. He says, baptize them in my name. And he says, for lo, I am with thee to the end. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus is with us. He's with us. He is with you. So he says, pray in your most holy face. He says, build yourself up as an edifice. Going higher and higher, he said. But while you pray in the Holy Ghost, he says, guard and keep yourselves, that is a mind and attitude, in the agape of God, the love of God. And because you are guarding and keeping yourself in the love of God, this is the evidence. He says, expect and patiently wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ which will bring to you or unto you life eternal. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. So this is the attitude every believer should have when we are praying in the world against disease. Not COVID only. COVID is not the only thing killing people. HIV, cancers, you know, people are dying of accidents. People are dying of all manner of disease. But he's saying while we are praying, this poverty in the world, Families are broken up in the world. But this is the guarantee for us to have the results we expect in God. That we are supposed to be established, encapsulated in God's love, in agape. We are supposed to be connected and aligned and keeping and guarding ourselves in the love of God. Expecting what? Judgment? Expecting what? Death? No. Expecting judgment? No. Expecting punishment? No. Expecting mercy. 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 As we are praying, God is having mercy on the world. God is having mercy on people. Not judgment, mercy. Because he told us, Whatsoever you shall ask, 
for God to fail to fulfill the prayers of the church it would only be because the church is not existent on the world and that is the rapture yeah, yeah I believe that if the church is not here then there is no prayer for God to answer and therefore there is no answered prayer because the church is not here but if the church is still on the earth and the rapture has not yet taken place whatsoever he says we shall ask and believe in our hearts and we have those things he says we shall have those things it's the simplicity which is in Christ if the church is raptured and there are no people in the church or there's no church all of them are carried in glory well then there is no believer at that particular hour to pray so then I'll understand oh then there is no answering of prayer but as long as there will be a believer on this earth his word will always stay true it will always abide faithful he says whosoever shall say to this mountain be thou removed and be thrown into the other sea and shall not doubt in his heart but believe that those things he has said shall come to pass he shall have whatsoever he said as long as the church of Jesus Christ is still on this earth all things in Christ are here and the men to the glory of the Father I personally don't believe that the regenerated Christian, the born again believer, will see corruption in this life. I honestly don't believe it. Because how can we get in a point where the word of God is not working? It's not so. It's not so. The church will have been taken. But there are those who believe after they've seen the church going and the Bible says, he that readeth shall understand. With those ones, the only difference is that during that time, by God, you know, uh, Satan will be given time, power for a given time, which is also spelled in scripture. And it is shortened. List many are lost so the scripture says why is it shortened because god is not comfortable when the church is not in control this is his body this is his body this is his body so when you pray in the love of god you build yourself higher and higher but it says but as you do don't forget to guard and keep yourself in agape. And the consequence of that agape, that as you're praying, the glory on the person of Jesus and the honor with him is on your life. Whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loosen on the earth shall be loosened in heaven. He says, on this rock shall I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. The war is not on the gates of the church. The war is on the gates of hell. And even when we approach them, they will not prevail against us. We are on the front line depopulating hell, breaking everything that is demonic and evil, establishing the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In Psalms 33, verses 18. Psalms 33, verses 18. It says, watch this. Watch this. Again, you have to see this. If your spirit doesn't see, if your eyes are blind, you will not see this. You have to see this. You have to see this love. You have to conceive it in your spirit. Okay? He says, watch this. God's eye is on those who respect him. The ones who are looking for his love. So when you open your heart to the love of God, his eyes are on you. His eye is on you. He's saying, who loves me? Who is expecting love and not judgment? Who is expecting love and not destruction? Who is expecting mercy and not decimation? Who is that? 
He says, the eye of God is on those who respect him. And how do we respect him? By obeying his word. By taking his word to be true. So he says, the God's eye is on those who respect him. The ones who are looking for his love. And the Bible says, verses 19, he's ready. He's ready. He's ready to come to their rescue in bad times. <laughs> Glory to God. He's ready. He's ready to come to their rescue in bad times. In lean times, he keeps body and soul together. That's why verse 20 says we are depending on God. He's everything we need. In all these trying times, the Bible says he is able to keep your body and soul together. You should believe that disease will not come near you. That a thousand will fall at one side and ten thousand on the other. He says, but none of those plagues shall come nigh thee. Because you abide in the shadow of the Almighty. You are there. You are in the shadow of the Almighty. You abide under his wings. You are loved by God. You are cherished by God. You are counted as his own offspring. So he said, he's ready to come. He's ready to come to those who are looking for love. If you're ready to embrace agape, he's ready to come and save you through any trying time. It might not be disease. It might be something else. But even if it's the worst disease in the world, you're probably watching now you have stage four cancer. Say, I receive your love, God. He's ready, the Bible says, to come in bad times and rescue them who are looking for his love. And in lean times, in famine, those are lean times. Those of you who are starving in your houses, you don't have food. The Bible says he's able to keep you. In the hardest times, he's going to keep your body and soul. And the Bible says in verse 20, we are depending on God. He's everything we need. Verse 21 says, what's more, our hearts brim, because of that, our hearts brim with joy since we've taken for our own his holy name. We are called by his name, we're his children. So we carry a joy in our spirit. Even when you're home, you celebrate, you are happy. You're not somber and moody and, and sad. No. And verses 22, I love the way this guy says, he opens his heart and says, love us God with all you've got. That's what we're depending on. You love us, love us God, love us, love us. Love. We receive that love. We receive that love. Glory to God. We receive that love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Open your mouth right now. Open your heart right now. Open your heart. Just receive God's love. The song that says, Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh my soul, I worship your whole name. Father, we thank you for your love. We receive your love. We receive your glory. We receive your honor. We receive everything that you've given us in Christ. And by your word you've said you've given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. In your word you say you've given us everything. Everything. That pertains to life and godliness. Everything. You have said that you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Jesus is with us. So we receive love in this hour. And may that love move in our bodies for divine health and healing for them that are afflicted of any disease, any virus, whether whatever is now or before. God is healing you now in the name of Jesus. Receive healing. Receive breakthrough. 
receive provision because he loves you. If he feeds the birds and clothes the flowers, the lilies of the field, take no note on what you shall eat or drink. My God shall supply. He says he will rescue you in bad times. This will not touch a believer that believes this word tonight. But I wait patiently for God's love and mercy. His love is with us. His grace is for us. Relationships are being restored now. Sicknesses are healing of every manner. Deliverance has come. Joy fills the air. Our homes will be full with joy. Our streets will be full of joy. Our nations will be full of joy. We will laugh. Joy is with us. In Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. If you have made that prayer, it is well with you. And if you're right there watching me, and you have never given your life to Christ, here is the good news. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have eternal life. Not might, not could, should not perish, but have eternal life. This is your opportunity in this hour I want to give you to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, to invite him in your heart through faith. And I want you to repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I have heard your word. My heart believes that you died for my sin and was raised my glory and today I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior Amen. the message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International for more information contact us on telephone number 041 466 4291 or email us at fenero at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash fenero. Fenero, make manifest.